Hey zombies, it's getting a little steamy up in here. Welcome to part two of this industrial steampunk look. If you're saying to yourself, what, part two, but, uh, but what? Then pause everything, look down in the description box below and follow the link to part one where we make these rusty prosthetics from scratch, complete with a lesson on tetanus. You don't wanna miss it. For those who have already seen the prep work video, let's hop right into the glam for this look as well as the prosthetic application. Hello there, if you're new here, my name's Mikey, and yes, I'm missing my eyebrows. I tried this new beauty trend of having leeches suck my brows off my face. It's supposed to be like an instant facelift. I, I don't know, do I look more awake to you now? If you're not keeping up with this trend, then I suggest you either block out your brows with a glue stick first or just leave your natural brows or heck, do whatever you want. It's your face, that seems like a pretty good rule of thumb to live by. I'm priming my eyes before we get glammed, which, if you're kind of on the fence about shadow primers, I'd say it's most helpful to use one, well, a good one that actually makes a difference, when using bright or metallic shadows especially. You can get away with not using one for neutral matte shadows, but a good primer will really bring out the color payoff in a hot pink or the iridescence in a gold. And we're using metallics for this one, so yeah. Prime till you die. Mwah. D dime. As you might have guessed, I'll be going for rusty type colors, starting with this metallic gold shadow. If you want the exact name, I'll leave it in the description, but any shadow you have that's semi-close will work just fine. I don't want you feeling limited for not having the exact same products you see in a tutorial. Note to self, do not have the office on in the background while trying to film a tutorial unless you want to be making that awkward, holding back laughter, might need to sneeze kind of face half the time. So I'm packing that gold onto the center of my lid with a dense, flat packing brush. I choose these types of brushes when I'm most concerned about depositing the most color possible. A fluffy brush will not get you the same payoff, though depending on the look you might want that. Another note about the dense flat brushes is that I generally pat shadows onto the lid with those rather than use a swipe or circular motion like you would a fluffy brush. When I was young, I knew I'd grow up and accomplish great things, but I didn't know I'd also grow up and look like Marilyn Manson sometimes. I digress. So now I'm taking this coppery metallic shadow on a different dense packing brush and I'm patting that at the inner and outer corners of the lid. I'm also taking that down under my lower waterline. If this ain't your first glam and gore rodeo, then you probably already know this is how I generally do my shadow. But in case you're a brand spanking new zombie, I usually use the dense brushes to pack on the colors that I want first and where I want the most concentrated areas of color, and then I blend them out second with a fluffy brush, starting with the brush clean and then adding in more color to blend it out as needed. That's what I'm doing here, just starting to blend out that copper color with a fluffy brush. You definitely don't need to do your shadow this way, but it's just how I prefer to do it most of the time, and I think it could be a helpful order, especially for those just starting to work on their glam skills. Keeps it really simple. Seriously, I gotta turn off the office. I can't work under these conditions. So in keeping with the rest theme, I wanted to have the eye makeup reflect that kind of dripping, messy feel, so I started pulling that copper way down below my lower lash line with it sort of coming down to a rough point in the center. I thought this look would benefit from being eyebrowless, so I blended the top of the eye makeup pretty high, higher than I would if I had the brows on. Then I felt it still needed something a bit darker in some areas, so I'm using this metallic brown to deepen those outer and inner corners. I'm using a pencil brush this time instead of a flat packing brush simply to be more precise with my application, but it's still the same general idea of laying down the most concentrated area first and then blending out the edge of it second. Don't forget to bring that brown down under the lash line too. So at this point, I started playing around with how I could make this look more weathered to go with the industrial steampunk vibe, and I used the brown shadow on a tiny brush to start drawing uneven lines down from my lower lash line. When I think of rust, I often think of it running down off the sides of a building from rain over time or off of... Uh, the head of a nail in a piece of metal. So that's kind of what I was going for here. And then I made the pit stop back to the lower water line to add in this metallic liner, mostly because it went perfectly with this look and I don't really get much use out of it otherwise. So uh, now's the time. Then some mistakes were made, but it's okay. Let's go through them. I love this half metallic, half glitter liner I have. I used it in my New Year's Eve Get Ready With Me and I've been dying to use it again in a look, so I started messing around with this metallic side, which led to the glitter side, which led to a whole lot of more glitter, and then I realized how not right of a look this is for glitter, or even the metallic liner, so I just picked most of it off and I tried to play it off like it never happened. But of course, glitter follows. So if you see a bunch of specks the rest of the time, just pretend, uh, just, just pretend there's something wrong with your screen. But let this be a lesson that you can recover a look even from a glitter mistake. A little redoing of the shadow and it was back on track. Of course, you could completely remove the makeup and start over, but I actually ended up liking the very, very slight remnants of the metallic liner you can see still. So yeah, don't be afraid to experiment and don't be afraid to work around experiments that you didn't end up liking 100%. Then we got some basics up in here. 
adding mascara to the top and bottom lashes, adding some fake lashes to the top. If you're interested in a more thorough explanation of how to put fake lashes on, as well as ways to make them more comfortable to wear, then check the description for the vid where I focus on that. So, for these fake lower lashes, I wanted to channel Kimberly Margarita, who is one, a makeup goddess, seriously, everything she does is perfection, and two, she's always rocking these PC chopped up lower lashes that make looks so much more interesting. So taking a very small page out of her encyclopedia of amazingness, I wanted to add that to this look by chopping up this pair of lashes. Notice how the very outer end of these lashes are the longest part? Okay, so for the PC lower lashes look, I'm chopping off that longest outer corner, and instead of placing it on the outer corner of my eye, I'm going to put that longest piece right in the middle. Sorry this isn't the easiest part to see. I was in intense concentration mode, but essentially after that you keep cutting off the next longest bit of fake lash and attaching it to either side of that longest middle lash. I did about 5 or 6 on each eye and the outer and inner corners end up being the shortest lashes. So think like upside down triangle of lashes. You got me? You got me. When you've got that situated on both eyes, the glam is done. On to the application of our prosthetics. So I'm choosing spirit gum for this look, and let me tell you why, because I don't usually go over why I choose spirit gum over Prosade or vice versa, but I switch them up pretty often. I actually hate using spirit gum. It dries and flakes in a way that makes my skin itchy, it's much more difficult and painful to get off, and it's messier to use because you need to touch it to test its tackiness, whereas Prosade you can look at it and tell if it's ready for application. However, I use spirit gum anytime I'm planning on wearing a look for a longer period of time. If I'm wearing the prosthetic in a location where I know I'll likely be sweating, or it's going to be raining, or there will be a lot of moisture, such as when the prosthetic is over my mouth. But more than anything, I choose spirit gum when the prosthetic is pretty heavy. Prosaid is water-based, so it can wear off a little more easy in sweaty or rainy situations, though it is pretty strong considering. It's much more comfortable, but for a piece with literal metal nuts and washers on it, I wasn't confident Prosade could carry its own weight. <laughs> Get it? Uh, yeah. It wasn't that funny, but it was something. Anyway, Prosade is ideal for really lightweight prosthetics like foam latex pieces, and I still choose it for most medium weight prosthetics, but this one calls for intense spirit gum action because it's just stronger for the most part. To use spirit gum is quite simple. Just paint it on the back of your prosthetic, paint it onto your face where the prosthetic will eventually sit. Wait a minute or two, check that the spirit gum is tacky by touching it, and if it is, then you're ready to sit the prosthetic down. If the spirit gum is slimy or slick, then it hasn't been sitting long enough, and you don't want to apply it yet. When you sit the prosthetic onto your face, you want to hold it there for a minute or two, especially a heavier one like this, because taking the weight off of it gives it the chance to make full contact with your skin so it'll have a better hold. I expected this piece to be pretty uncomfortable to wear, but it was actually one of the most comfortable ones I've ever worn. Woo for that! Repeat the same process for the small brow prosthetic. Cover any portion of your brow that it will go over with Vaseline first, so you don't end up with an accidental waxing upon removal. Make sure that your top piece prosthetic thing is also not placed too far away that the tubing you made in part one would be too short to reach it. That would suck. So, you could leave it like this if you wanted. It's pre-painted, matches the skin okay, edges aren't awful, but they're definitely not good. Since it's easy to see most of the edges on this one after it's already on your face, I'd recommend going back over them with more cotton and latex like we used in part one. To recap, that means laying down latex along an edge, putting small pieces of ripped up cotton balls on top of that, and covering it in more latex. Now you can sculpt and smooth that to make a smooth transition from your face to prosthetic. I built up the one edge quite a bit to make the transition less of a harsh start, but you can do this to what degree you want. To paint it, it's the same as in part one. I recommend doing a wash of brown using alcohol activated or water activated paints first to darken up the cotton, and then putting a product that matches your skin tone over it, be it more alcohol or water activated paint or your foundation. Though I will say foundation tends to oxidize differently on a cotton latex buildup than it will on your skin. So your better bet is matching it with other products you have, if at all available. But beyond that, you want to take the paint job a step further and add some irritation into the skin part of your prosthetic. I'm using a ripped up sea sponge and light washes of purples, reds, and browns to stamp on a very subtle bruise texture. You don't need a textured sponge for this, you can also mimic this pretty easily with a brush with enough practice. But you want to bring those colors onto your cotton skin and past it onto your real skin, with an uneven radius. This is a good way to blend an unideal medium into your skin. As I mentioned in part one, cotton and latex are certainly not the most realistic products to mimic real 
oil skin, but they are a great inexpensive medium with a lot of flexibility for life cast to face prosthetics like this. If you used silicone to mimic skin for this, you could get away with much less irritation based blending, but this is an easy way to circumvent that. Another option is to speckle the cotton skin areas with different shades of skin pigments like darker browns and some pinks, but I tend to avoid this because it usually requires doing it over a much larger area and I just tend to like the irritation look more aesthetically speaking. I mean, for God's sakes, we got we got metal pots coming out of our face. Like, you'd think it would be kind of irritated, no? When I was done with that, I used light washes of brown, gray, and some black to drag color down my neck off of the prosthetic. Again, for that drippy, dirty metal runoff kind of feel. Connect your mouth and brow prosthetics by sitting your tube into both. You know what? You know what? It's a forehead prosthetic. It's not a brow prosthetic. I just can't say forehead prosthetic, because if I do, y'all make fun of me. And if I say forehead, you make fun of me for not saying the word how I usually say it. All right, so <laughs> whatever, I do what I want. Connect your mouth and forehead prosthetics by sitting your tube into both, letting the pressure hold it in place. And then you're done with the makeup. <sighs> it's it's late when I'm recording this. I'm delirious. I apologize, kind of. Kind, not, not really, sorry, not sorry. Some accessories I'd recommend if you can get your hands on them is full black sclera contacts, steampunk accessories like goggles, gloves, hats, jewelry, etc., and a steampunky or post-apocalyptic type outfit to bring it all together. A side shave goes well with this look too. You know, if you feel like spontaneously cutting off half your hair today. With industrial steampunk post-apocalyptic being my aesthetic, I gotta say, this is one of the most fun looks for me to date. Even if I don't know what the purpose of that tube is, is it converting the carbon dioxide I breathe out into oxygen to feed my brain in a continual never-ending loop? Is it a bridge between my human brain and mechanical robot side that apparently starts in my mouth? Is it a clever cover-up for a feeding tube that allows me to still eat Reese's Pieces despite not having a real mouth to chew them with? The world may never know. But I hope you guys know some more things today because of this tutorial. See you in the next one, zombies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.